Hello, hello, everybody. Welcome to our webinar today on Core Web Vitals updates. Um, today, there are two of us going to have a conversation about Core Web Vitals. Um, my name is Russ Jeffrey. I'm the Director of Strategic Integrations. I'm one of uh, our resident experts here at Duda uh, on Core Web Vitals um, and kind of been following the, the industry really closely for the past several years. And really excited today to be joined by uh, Jason Bernard. Uh, from Calicube um, uh, on our webinar today. So Jason, welcome. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here. As you can see from the gray beard, I've been studying the internet for a long time. I started in 1998, which is a long time ago now. I think so. And, and Jason, we wanted to start off and just give a little background on who you are and a little bit about uh, kind of what, what you do on, on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah, well, I'm, I call myself the brand SERP guy. And the idea is the brand SERP is what Google shows when your audience Googles your brand name. Uh, and I honestly think this is vastly underestimated. Uh, and John Mueller the other day tweeted that he thinks that my work on brand SERPs is vastly underestimated. So I'm terribly pleased about that. Um, and so this is my brand SERP. I've been working on mine for the last seven years. Uh, I also work on brand search for clients, and CaliCube is actually a brand search platform that helps you with that. So I'm going to tell my story, who I am, what I do through my brand search. So I'm the brand search guy. If you look at the next slide, I'm also the knowledge panel guy. I look at knowledge panels. I'm incredibly interested by how Google understands the world, knowledge panels being Google's representation of how it has understood facts in the world. So it's incredibly important, fundamentally important for what's going to come next in SEO and talking talking, communicating with Google. Next slide. I have two decades in digital. As I said, I started in 1998 and I actually started as a blue dog in a cartoon, built a site for kids. I'm the blue dog on the left and my ex-wife is the yellow koala on the right. Uh, and you can see that on the right hand side, but it doesn't dominate the brand SERP because my current job dominates the brand SERP as we will see. I've got a groovy, a groovy podcast intelligent interesting and fun i interview lots of great people in digital marketing they've taught me absolutely loads 176 episodes if you want to go and listen to them all it would take you several days and the next one i also i'm a speaker and host as you can see obviously so that's probably a bit of a redundant slide doesn't tell you anything you haven't already realized uh going around the world i used to go around the world or digital nomad traveling around the world speaking at conferences doing my interviews for my podcast with people like Brad fishkin and yost devout from yost Next up, I'm also a writer, author. I write for Search Engine Journal, Search Engine Land, SEMrush, and various other platforms, SE Ranking, WordLift, all wonderful, wonderful publications who publish my delightful articles. And the next slide, I'm a tutor and coach. I teach brand SERPs and knowledge panels, and I've just built this platform called Calicube Pro, which is the next slide, which hasn't actually got onto my brand SERP yet, so that's a bit of a miss on my part. But it, I started literally a month ago, so I'll get it up there in the next few uh, weeks. Uh, that's a plan for this weekend. My Saturday and Sunday will be spent trying to get Calicube Pro SaaS platform onto my brand SERP so that I can tell the full story go. properly. There you go. That's who I am. Great. Thanks, Jason. And, and super excited to have you on board today. And I think we're going to have a really, really fun conversation today about kind of where Core Web Vitals is, where it's going and kind of what's going on. So yeah, um, and it, it does look like I don't know about Core Web Vitals, but actually I do. With 20, 20 years in the industry, I've been looking at all this stuff. I just happen to specialize today in brand search. I'm defending myself here. Absolutely, and I'll, I'll back you up from, from our from our conversations. You, you definitely know what you're talking about. Yeah. Thank you very much. That's very kind, Russ. You know what you're talking about too. This is terrible. Love him. How wonderful. Um, so so cool, guys. What, what we'll cover today, these are uh, topics for, for our discussion. Uh, one is what is Core Web Vitals? We'll, we'll talk about kind of what, what, what the actual metrics are and what it means. Um, how you measure what a good experience looks like uh, and what is a good experience on the web. Where does where is Google kind of pulling these core web vitals from? Um, you know, we'll, we'll discuss kind of some of the problems that we see in the industry. It's it's a very confusing topic and it's a really difficult topic to solve. So we'll, we'll kind of dive in there. Uh, we, we also want to discuss the long term impacts of core web vitals uh, on the industry and on the market. Uh, and then also how it how it, how it has already and, and will continue to impact uh, SERP results as well. A little bit of housekeeping. Um, one, we, we will have time for questions at the end. So if you do have questions, please go ahead and ask those in the, the questions box. Uh, we have a few folks from the Duda side uh, ready to answer questions and also kind of surface some questions up uh, as well. 
Um, so please ask those and, and we will get to those uh, right, right at the end of the webinar. We also are recording this uh, and we will be sending out the recording to anyone who registered. So if you wanna forward this on to a friend uh, or colleague, uh, you'll, you'll get that link. Usually we send it about a day after the actual webinar happens so our team can process it and upload it and all that fun stuff. Uh, and with that being said, um, let's go ahead and, and let's let's jump into uh, our discussion today. So let, let, let the first kind of topic for us to discuss is is what are core web vitals? Jason, do you, do you want to give us just a quick overview of, of what these are? Well, I like to look at core web vitals as Google attempting to stop focusing on pure speed and start to focus on its perception of how our user experience is with a page. So perceived speed. Uh, is perhaps a good way of putting it. Um, you're the, the the real kind of techie person, and you're going to explain it much better than that. But I think as a human being, I would say what Google's trying to measure is people's perception of how fast your website is, and if that and how good a user experience it gives in that context. Uh, and the next slide I think shows that really, really clearly. I think it's a it's a it's a lovely, lovely way of showing it. That it's Google. It's not Russ or me. Uh, but it does show how web, core web vitals fit into the speed aspect of Google's measurement of your website. There you go, that um, yep. at the top. I'll let you explain that because I think you're probably better at it than I am. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Google's core web vitals here, they're, one is, you know, for a long time, we've known that Google prioritizes speed and speed has been a ranking factor, but we never had any real metrics to to measure that on. You know, Google just kind of wishy-washily said speed mattered. Um, and now we're getting real tests and real metrics from Google that can can be measured. And, and like you said, Jason, these are uh, metrics that um, they focus on the perceived experience on the actual website. They're not the total loading time. They're not looking at every single aspect of you know performance of a website. There are three metrics that Google has decided to essentially prioritize and say, here are the core web vitals metrics. Uh, for anyone that's looked at a you know, page speed report or a lighthouse report, you'll know that they have other metrics that they use as well as part of this, but these are the three that, that Google has, has really kind of set in stone as, as the, what, what they're calling the core web vitals uh, in, in the market. And just quickly, what the, what those three are, um, we'll, we'll cover this. One is LCP, which is how quickly do I see content? What is the how long does it take for the largest piece of content on the site um, to actually to actually load? So that's what the largest contentful pane is. The second one is FID, um, which is uh, first input delay. It's basically how long after I tap does it take for the screen to respond? Um, and then the final one is CLS uh, or cumulative layout shift, which is when the page is loading, are things kind of shifting around on the page directly? And so each one of these has their own metrics to hit a good score on top of it. Yeah, I mean, I kind of think we've got so many acronyms going on. We've got CWV, LCP, FID, CLS. And just looking at that screen, when it's actually spelt out for you, it makes so much sense. And the screen before said it's all about loading, interactivity, and the comfort of the experience on the page, which is left to right, what we're looking at, um, which just makes it more understandable, but people can't help having these really crazy acronyms that confuse us. Uh, it's, it's, it's totally true. Uh, it it kind of comes from the engineering culture at, at Google, right? Where they're, they're focused on, on solely just coming up with these, you know, these metrics that they try and encompass a lot of things within these metrics uh, as part of it. And, and they just end up a little bit with this acronym soup. I completely agree. It's it's uh, it's it's quite confusing, and Google now has you know three, four, five different testing tools out there um, of like how to measure speed on a website, and mm. it's not clear which one they use where and what people should be using, and and how uh, how this is kind of leveraged across the industry. Um, you know, we'll, we'll get into this a little bit later about um, how the actual speed comes through, um, and and kind of the differences between you know the the, the lab environment and the real environment. Uh, in the live environment uh, from, from a usage perspective. It's, it's pretty confusing. Brilliant, but what's nice about this particular set is it focuses on perceived user experience. Right, yeah, and, and, and I, I, think, I think that's the right thing to focus on, right? Um, and kind of the, the right area to be, okay, great, this is focusing on how people actually perceive it on top of a website. And this kind of gets in right into our, our next topic, Jason, which is, um, what is a good experience and, and how, how do you measure 
um, that that good experience uh, directly on on the site itself. Right. Well, I mean, one of the big problems that Google would always have is how do they measure our perception of things? There's a big difference between how a machine can measure it, i.e. how literally fast it actually shows, how literally fast you can actually interact, and how literally it moves around, and the perception that people have of that. And I remember, you know, maybe eight or nine years ago, there was a whole test thing going on on the internet, and I played on it for hours on end and wasted so much, so much working time. And they would show you two websites, and they would say, which one loads faster? <laughs> and you would click on the button, you'd say, that one, that one, that one, that one, that one. And in right. fact, they did that complete at scale. And what they then did was push that into their machine learning and figure out what is important for us as human beings in terms of perception to saying that is faster than that, regardless of whether technically it is actually faster or not. Right, right. And and th this, just like you're saying, right, th this is actually what, what Google's prioritizing. They're, they're saying that, great, we want you to show something on the screen as quickly mm. as possible. We would actually rather you have a, a loading experience to show that something has happened rather than waiting you know, five seconds for everything to be ready and then just display everything all at once on the website itself. And that, that's exactly what, what you're saying, that, that those tests probably proved that great. Um, you, know, you wanna make sure that you have some indication that something is happening. You're giving visual feedback to users as the site is loading that something is happening. I think we, we've all experienced, you know, kind of the, the white screen of the web where you go to a website and it just sits there and, you know, doesn't load for a long time. And that's just because, you know, the, usually it's the technical thing is JavaScript is preventing the page from loading. It's being what's called blocked um, from, from actually rendering the page. And uh, this especially happens on a lot of mobile devices and a lot of lower powered mobile devices. So. Oh, just talking of which, a couple of things. One of which is we forget that as users, we get incredibly frustrated after even half a second, let alone a whole second of just looking at a screen, waiting for something to happen. We've forgotten what we were doing, That's right. um, which as human beings, we've got a very short attention span. And apparently that isn't actually getting shorter, although we tend to suggest that it might, it isn't. Uh, but as human beings, when you're coming over from Google, you see that white screen for more than half a second, you've forgotten what you were looking for. Um, and as site owners, we should be aware that as users, we're very critical of that. And as site owners, we need to meet that expectation. And the other point I would make is not it's not because you're sitting in your office and it's loading incredibly fast that it's loading incredibly fast for everybody, number one. And number two, Google isn't actually measuring it on your on a really fast internet speed. It's, it's judging it on an internet speed that it considers to be normal. And if you think about people, for example, in India who are on 3G networks, Right. Google are actually measuring all of this as if the person was in India because that is a vast, vast number of people. And we in the in the in the in the in Europe and America with these in big cities with these fast internet co connections are totally spoiled, and we fail or forget, and I certainly forget that you know not everybody has that experience. Even the countryside in France, it can be really slow. It's 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 totally true, and and you know it's going to vary, just like you're saying, where not everyone's always on on Wi-Fi, and not not everyone actually has a fast internet, right? The average um, cell connection today is at a 3G speed, right, around the world. Um, hmm. It's like a fast 3G speed. Not everyone is on 4G, let alone 5G yet uh, around the world. Um, and, and, and and importantly, even if you think my audience is actually on fast networks and fast in cities and it's B2B in Paris or in uh, in New York, that doesn't actually matter from Google's perspective because it's still judging you as though your users were on a very slow connection. So Google's opinion of the site speed of your website affects how it ranks you rather than the actual use of your audience. Yeah, and, and th this, this gets into to, to kind of one of the interesting points that I see about Lighthouse or, you know, when you are the PageSpeed Insights tool directly, just like we're saying here, the PageSpeed Insights tool tests on one, a lower power device. So a, a lower powered CPU, uh, a, a lower amount of RAM, also a lower connection speed uh, as well. And, and so a lot of people will go to the, the Lighthouse test and get a, you know, a mediocre score on, on top of their websites where it's great. Lighthouse gives you a 50 out of 100. Uh, but the reality is that that's a, a really, it's a pretty stringent test uh, because Google is trying to simulate those real world use cases. And um, 
I think it's it's absolutely the right thing that Google is doing and pushing people to to optimize for the slower devices. But one thing that actually Duda sees from our internal data is that you know we have a lot of customers in the US and in Europe and on our websites the real world visits are actually much faster than Lighthouse is actually reporting. Right. So the like with Core Web Vitals, Core Web Vitals is measured with what's called field data, or real world data. And so we see websites actually passing the Web Vitals test, but scoring a 50 on Lighthouse, uh, yeah. which Google would rank in, in the red um, directly. And so it's one of those interesting things where, you know, Core Web Vitals itself does matter from, from only kind of the real world visitors, but the testing tool is quite stringent and pushes people uh, really far, which I think is the right thing to do, but at the same time, it might be unrealistic just based on who the users are that actually visit the site and, and come up with it. Right, yeah, it can be scary and it isn't necessary to always scare people. That's right, that's right. Um, great, um, I'm gonna jump over just Go, go on to our, our next topic here. Um, you know, what, what are kind of some of the difficulties that agencies, developers, and kind of site owners face? Jason, what, what's your experience here? Well, I'm, I'm a very, very small agency. So I actually tend to get called into relatively few sites and they say, what can we do? And I analyze it on a one by one-on-one -on -one basis and figure out what it is that they need to do specifically for that image, that the, the big, you know, first uh, largest contentful paint to come up, figure out right. what that is, get them to speed that up, then get them to make sure that people can interact with the page quickly and then make sure that things aren't moving around once it's all char charged, loaded, sorry, which is the, the three things that you need to look at. And I'm incredibly intrigued by how you do that at scale, which is what Duda does. <laughs> how does Duda do what Duda does? Uh, uh, it's, it, it's, it, it's, it, it's it's complex and it's it's difficult to do it to do it really at scale. You know, due to we're we're building a, a generic product and a generic platform um, for for agencies to build on top of. And due to you know we're taking care of almost every aspect, not every aspect, but but a lot of aspects of core web vitals as part of what we do. So out of the box, you know, due to implements all of kind of the best practices that you would expect. We automatically you know compress images resize them even change the format to webp uh, automatically uh, and and serve those we take care of all of the standard caching policies on your cdns and make sure that things load quickly globally um, and and one of the really interesting things that we do is we actually um, when you when you publish a site with duda we actually scan the website and identify all of the above the fold content and we take all of those styles and we put it into the actual page. And what that does is it prioritizes the loading of all of the above the fold content uh, from, from our websites. And so this is something that's automated and baked into the platform. And so our engineers have spent a lot of time just thinking of, okay, for this specific use case with this specific you know, map widget that exists on the site, how can we improve the loading experience? How can we improve the loading experience with this header and this structure and, and make sure that it's fast? And it's incredibly difficult and it requires a lot of focus and, and a lot of kind of um, priorities. And it's been a topic that we've been investing in for, for seven or eight years. And you know, I think I think this is this is one area where agencies more broadly kind of struggle is it's not just on them to fix these problems, right? It is on the CMS providers, it's on the Dudas, it's on the WordPresses, it's on the you know, the, the whoever, you know, platform you're building on top of, it's on their tool set to also optimize for these things and make this kind of core to the product and core to the experience of, of building uh, as a whole. And so we see people who scan their site through, you know, PageSpeed, and then they're not really sure what to do next because PageSpeed is a very technical tool and isn't great at giving recommendations specific for WordPress or specific for Duda or specific for, uh, Shopify yeah. or whatever tool out there you're using. Yeah. Yeah, sure. I mean, what I've seen is WordPress have actually improved quite a lot, but then with WordPress, you have that terrible problem of plugin bloat and people adding plugins all over the place for bells and whistles. Uh, and that's kind of one of the disadvantages of these kind of open source platforms is you get lots of control and it's free and you can do lots of things with it, which is great, wonderful. But there is a danger that you run down those roads. And I, I tend to tell clients stick as close to the core as you possibly can because that's where you're going to benefit from all the work that the people who are actually developing the entire thing are, are, are going to be bringing to you. Yeah, 
Well, one actually interesting kind of data point here, and I'll, I'm going to switch slides here, is Duda did a, a survey uh, back in March um, asking web professionals broadly whether they're ready uh, for uh, core web vitals and, and what they think the, the impact um, is going to be. And so what you'll see here is that roughly 90% uh, uh, and above of web pros kind of think that core web vitals is going to have a moderate or significant impact on the web um, as a whole. And this will lead us into our next topic uh, here in a second. Um, but uh, conversely, a lot of web, uh, a lot of agencies and web professionals actually haven't done a lot to actually prepare and get ready for this. And, and I think there's just, there's this big, you know, gap between real designers and real actual implementation and the technical details that either Google is putting out um, and, and kind of are, are on the market ready to go for, for a lot of these things. I think there's a pretty big gap in the market right. from a knowledge and, and education perspective there. So you'll see um, our data says that, you know, more than 50% of web pros have done nothing uh, to optimize for, for core web vitals um, across the whole and, and even, even less have done something, but, but not enough, so. Right, which is a terribly human kind of fault. We know it's important, but we don't necessarily do anything about it. <laughs> it's it's so true. Um, I, I mean, from and from an agency point of view, working for clients, a lot of the time I say this is really important, but uh, then there's not necessarily the reactivity or the realization that this is something that not only helps them in their ranking with Google, but will also help their client experience, their user experience, and therefore help them convert, presumably. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's it's one of those really hard trade-offs from a priority perspective for for a lot of development teams. You're you're often having to prioritize: Am I optimizing for my conversion rate? Am I not getting that next page up on my website? Am I not improving X other thing on my service and on my tool? And you instead you spend time kind of more in the background, something that's not user facing, it's not visible. Um, and you you kind of have to prioritize that back end work from a development perspective to to make it happen. And I think that's that's a hard trade off for for a lot of companies to make just because it's it's not the most glamorous type of thing because it's it's not yeah. as apparent for so many people. And and uh, you know you say oh show your boss this and you say look at this brilliant new thing we've just done we spent three weeks working on it and the boss says I actually can't see a difference it looks exactly the same to me um, and that is a very difficult sell because you can't physically see it. Well especially when the boss is either they're viewing it on their laptop or they're mm. just recently bought iPhone that's brand new and has the fastest speed and they're on Wi-Fi they, they don't see the difference um, uh, of what's out there absolutely. Yeah. Until they go on holiday to some tiny island in the middle of nowhere and they suddenly realize that it's really slow and get very frustrated. It, 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 exactly, exactly. Send the box on holiday. That's the solution. <laughs> and then send them the website to proof. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, cool. Um, you know, one, one thing I, I just want to call this out, um, you know, Web, Web Vital sets a pretty high bar um, across the web. And so we, we see this um, you know, pretty frequently that only roughly 20% of websites on mobile um, actually can kind of meet this good criteria across the web today. So um, if you are not passing the web vitals, that, that is absolutely okay. And, and you're in good company with, with many of the websites um, on the web today. So just keep that in mind that this, this is, you know, it's, it's a high bar. And you know, I think, Jason, I think both you and I agree that this is the right thing to do. It's just a, it's just a hard one to do. It's a hard one to do. It's a high bar and it's on mobile. And a lot of us, despite the fact Google have been saying mobile first, and even within our traffic, what we see on our site, we see that it's mobile first. In our everyday lives, it's mobile first for us too. Uh, and our kids especially, I would imagine, in, in my case, because I've got the gray beard. But um, we, we see all of this and we know all of this. And once again, it's that human fault. What we know we should be doing and what we know we do do in real life, we don't necessarily implement for ourselves. Absolutely. Um, cool. And 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 our, our final topic here um, is is kind of what do we think the the impact is going to be on on SERP results? And I'll, I'll start off here, Jason, and then I'll, I'll hand it off to you. You know, I think one of the things that is, is a longer term trend that we've seen from Google is that they they broadly know that the mobile uh, hmm. web today is is too slow. And that's one of the reasons they're pushing out core web vitals is just because the is that 
when users click on a website, they're much more likely to bounce back on mobile and come back to Google. And so Google has gone down this path of delivering search results directly on the mobile page and trying to surface that information quicker because Google knows they can deliver a good experience um, on top of that. I think this is one of the factors that really plays into some of these position zero SERP results and FAQ schema that you see and Google surfacing more content in its search results page um, as as a whole. Uh, but Jason, I'd be really interested to kind of hear what you think about this uh, as well. Well, the whole um, content on Google SERP, getting the answer on Google SERP and not sending the user through to the website is a phenomenally important question that we all need to start to address. Um, yeah. And Google's motivation is multifold. I mean, there is the idea, and I think you're 100% right, they know they can deliver a good experience, therefore, they can they can say well if we don't have to take the risk of sending this person to a website we won't do it also their aim is the same as our aim which is to best serve our clients as efficiently and as well as we possibly can and if that means giving the answer on the SERP for google in their business best interests they need to serve their clients so although it might be painful it's also important to recognize that Google are just trying to make for a good experience for their users. Remember the people who are searching on Google are their users. They might be potentially your audience, but they remain Google's users who Google are trying to satisfy. They're Google's clients because Google makes money out of advertising to those users. Um, so it, it's painful and we need to figure out as marketers, how do we work around this? Uh, how, do you, how do you work around the fact that Google is tending to show more results on the SERP? And one of them is, in fact, called Web Vitals. If, if you can prove that you're fast and that it, the overall experience for the user will be better on your site, personally, I see no reason that Google wouldn't send the user to that site because, once again, Google is trying to satisfy its users, make sure that they're happy. And as you said, if people are bouncing back off your site, that's a bad user experience from Google's perspective. It wants, it wants people to come to your site, get the res response, and not bounce back and then search for the same thing again and go to somebody else or eventually get it on the site. Yeah. Yeah, and, and one thing uh, that you mentioned there is that Google has been actively testing is, is a little indicator on mm. the SERP result, right? You see this little kind of star icon sitting next to the results. This is something that you know Google has said they're testing. They're not sure if they're going to roll it out, but it's a clear indicator that, hey, we think this is a, a good experience and you can trust you know this this site and it'll it'll load quickly for you which which i mean the idea from their perspective is to say you know if you've got the choice between two and one of them's got the little icon you're liable to click on the second one which has a double effect one of which is that the, the second one gets more traffic uh, and if you don't have the little icon potentially you won't get as much traffic but secondly of course that, that that one that's getting more traffic will tend to push up the rankings because that's the one that's satisfying google's users it's, it's 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 absolutely right, and just I think it's 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 kind of interesting to see how they're they're changing these SERP results, you know, based off of some of these factors, um, and and playing this in. Obviously, it's also a ranking factor um, on the site. So if your site is higher, you're going to score higher. It is not the biggest ranking factor. It's there, there's obviously things that are going to be way more important, but but that also is going to just play into you know where you're positioned in those in those SERP results as well. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think kind of ranking factors, the, the, the whole concept is, um, is incredible. I mean, it's important in the sense that we need to think about what affects the ranking. But Google and Bing, I mean, I talked to the guys at Bing about uh, how, how their whole system works, which is reasonably similar to how Google would function in terms of their algorithm. And it's all machine learning. It isn't people writing lines, lines of code say, if this has core web vitals, it can be higher. It's a machine analyzing masses and masses and masses of real-time data to understand what will give the best user experience to Google's users. So kind of the idea of factors is less ranking factors, but how is the machine perceiving the user experience both on the SERP and on your site? And it's machines analyzing this at a scale that we can't begin to imagine. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think I think that's that's it's, it's important to call out and kind of what you're getting at I think is, is also kind of the intent factor behind the search right Google is looking to interpret the intent of the search and mm. deliver the right experience based on on that intent and as as you know as you know there, there's a lot of different intents out there and you know, theoretically they're going to return a local result from their local pack if it's a low if they interpret it 
as a local intent. And local is a perfect example of one of those position zero results where they're they're taking over those results and just delivering the content mm. uh, immediately. Yeah. And, and really quickly, coming back to that, if, if anybody's wondering how can Core Web Vitals affect ranking if nobody's actually writing it into the machine, into the the actual algorithm? It's because Google have informed the machine that this is one of the aspects it should be looking at. So basically, what they do is they say to the machine, "Here are the aspects you should be looking at. Here's all the data. Here's a set of mathematical formulas that you can use to calculate it." And every time the machine makes a decision, it is trying to figure out the best solution in that specific situation for the intent of the user that it has perceived. And what Google then do is feed all the data back in saying, this was good, this was bad. You made the right decision here, you made the wrong decision here, so that you've got corrective data being pushed back into the machine, and you've got reassuring data or confirmation data, which means the machine says, okay, out of these two cases, I got that one wrong, that one right, next time I'll go more down this path. So you have the machine which is constantly learning. So as Core Web Vitals become more common and more commonly, uh, how can we say, respected by websites, the more important I would imagine they would become in that calculation. I couldn't agree more, couldn't agree more. Uh, I, I, <laughs> I, think, I think that's really important. Jason, um, shall we jump into some kind of Q&A here? Um, actually, um, we, we do have the topic of kind of what we think is is the, the long-term impact right. for wide battles. Um, one last topic here, and we'll, we'll jump into to our Q&A. You know, I, um, and you were covering just kind of your, your initial kind of th thoughts on this. You know, I, I think what, what I would add from a long-term perspective is, is that it, one, you know, I think we will see core web vitals continue to evolve as well. I think Google is, is getting much better at how they measure these specific um, experiences on top of a website. So we've already started to see Google evolve the CLS metric a little bit in the past month or so. Really? They've come out and, and actually said, great, um, in the past we were measuring CLS based on the total layout, the total shifts that happened on the page and kind of the, the, the related movement. But now we're going to actually chunk that out into different segments because we know that, you know, roughly there's like these five second, you know, segments where most of it's going to happen. And we're going to try and average it across these different segments. And they're trying to just be more accurate with it and more reliable with, with these metrics um, as they roll them out. So I think one, you'll see an evolution of these. And then I think Google will probably also maybe remove and add more as they, they get better at this. You know, Core Web Vitals is really just, you know, their, their start of trying to understand a lot of these. And so I, I think this, this is going to be something to, to continue to evolve and, and continue to what will change over time. And I would watch for this actually at, at Google I.O. I'm willing to bet they're going to announce some type of, of update to Core Web Vitals there uh, that later this month. So. Right. Yeah, no, I think that's an incredibly important point uh, about Core Web Vitals, that it will evolve and it will change as Google get better and learn more, uh, just as everything within the Google algorithm has evolved over the years. And one thing that I found interesting, I did um, a, a, a day at seminar at Google France, and they went through how the basically what happened is they had the ambition to do what they're doing today 20 years ago. They just didn't have the technology to do it. So they developed the technology to be able to do big data, uh, machine learning, uh, and, and, and really work at scale and understand all of this stuff. So Google is a constantly developing the technology to be able to do what it already intended to do, which is deliver the best user experience to its users, given their intent in their given situation at any one moment. Uh, absolutely, couldn't, couldn't agree more. Um, Great. So, so let's let's jump into some some questions. We have a bunch of questions uh, to kind of get to. Um, really want to thank everyone for joining. We will send out a, a replay. Really thank Jason for for being a part of this as well and and agreeing to to to, to be here with us. And so I'm going to jump right into to questions here. Um, Jeff Kallenberg is is asking um, the most important thing I would like to know is what is Duda doing um, and how is it going to improve Duda site performance. Um, Really, really going for for the tough questions uh, right off the bat there. Um, so, so I think you know what, what I would say right right off the bat here is that Duda is, is investing quite a bit of time in Core Web Vitals as a whole. We we have a whole kind of part of our engineering team 
that's focused on improving uh, scores across the board. And um, actually some data I can share from our internal metrics is we've seen uh, about a 50% improvement of CLS um, since January 1st on across all of our websites. We've seen a 40% improvement in LCP scores across all of our websites since January 1st. Um, and then we don't have much improvement on the FID score um, because actually most websites do really well on FID already. It's something like 97% of sites pass FID. Um, and so um, we, we're, we're not as focused on that one. We don't really have improvement to show uh, on the last one. But what Duda is really investing in is, is we, we are finding the biggest causes of these issues and we're focusing on it. And the one thing I'll, I'll call out here, because um, this I think is a confusing thing for a lot of Duda customers, is we are focused really solely on the Web Vitals metrics and less all of the Lighthouse metrics uh, or the Page Speed Insights metrics. Um, and so sometimes what you'll see is, is you know, we get a high score on, um, you know, or we get a low score on maybe a Lighthouse or a Page Speed where it's like a 50 or a 60, but the reality is, is often those things are going to pass the core Web Vitals tests. Um, as, as part of it. And so um, a lot of the, the recommendations in the page speed tests are just that, they're recommendations and they're opportunities. And so uh, can, that's, can that's you go as far as we're, we're gonna be introducing um, some kind of help material here in the future to kind of give some guidance for our customers too, of how they can improve this on their own too. Oh, wonderful, sorry, I had a question which was, can you go as far as to say that people who use Duda don't need to worry so much about all those tests because Duda are actually looking after the really fundamental stuff? It's a good question. Um, I, I would say like the answer is like 80% yes to that, um, where we're, we're doing a lot of the things automatically and we're, we're implementing a lot of the best practices out of the box. But the reality is, is you know, we, we're a flexible platform and a flexible tool. And you know, we, we don't have 100% control over the final websites. You know, if somebody comes and includes their own Google, uh, like Google Tag Manager script or their own, you know, website with like map embed, those things are going to slow down the site. And, you know, Duda doesn't have control over those type of things. And so there are some best practices that you can do on your own to avoid these slowdowns and really improve the site as a whole. But there's also a lot that Duda is kind of doing out of the box. Uh, to to just improve this and so it's not as easy as a, as a yes or no answer I'd, I'd love to say yes but I mean, it's not the case yeah but it, it does come back to saying what I was saying about WordPress earlier on is it, the closer you stick to the core the less likely you are, you are to have problems and the more you guys can actually deal with this for people yeah yeah um, uh, the next question we have here is is from Benjamin Lutz um, Following the measurement of all these fancy, trending Java-based websites, uh, should have a should they sh sorry I'm going to start this question over. Following the measurement of all those fancy, trending Java-based websites should have a crazy bad ranking because uh, it's it always has a slow loading time. Is that your experience, Jason? I'm curious if you have a lot of experience with kind of some of these little more heavy JavaScript-based sites. No, I don't have a great deal of experience with the heavy JavaScript websites, but in fact, with I mean. If I were building a JavaScript website, obviously you need to load the library, the JavaScript library, but if you want to be smart, you would load a small library that does the big picture, i.e. shows the user something, allows them to interact with the page, make sure nothing moves when the big chunk comes behind and actually builds the page around it. Um, but that becomes relatively complicated. But the other thing about JavaScript rendered sites is that you would tend to want to do server-side rendering. You would render the entire page on the server and then deliver it as HTML, which makes it very fast. So that kind of, if, if you're still delivering all the JavaScript to the browser and then getting that to render in the browser, you're probably suffering already. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, this is, you know, this is one of those weird, weird kind of trends across the web where, you know, a lot of developers use these heavy JavaScript libraries because they're easy to use and. Mm -hmm. Uh, they're they're easy to implement and they're they're now kind of part of the modern tool belt of a developer. Um, and the reality is that a they're they're not great for speed and they really can slow down uh, the site, especially that all important kind of first load experience, like you're saying. Um, and then you know further um, that 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 a lot of these you know tools they don't take into account speed as as the performance and kind of core thing uh, from from the initial. They're also not all that SEO friendly uh, as well, and they cause problems on that side too. So. 
Sure. Yeah. I mean, the, the more you're putting, I mean, I, I like to tell bells and whistles. Every time you put in a bell or a whistle, you're always going to be handicapping yourself to some extent. So you need to choose your bells and whistles very carefully. That's very true. It's very true. Um, great. I want to jump on to the uh, to to the next question here. Um, Rebecca is asking, um, how do we communicate to clients that Lighthouse reports aren't necessarily reliable if they score so low? Ooh, I, what well, one thing that that strikes me about Lighthouse is I keep see, seeing people post on Twitter, oh, I've got 99% on Lighthouse, and they've spent the last five days getting from 90 to 95%. Person, I mean, it, it, it's great, and it's one of those satisfying things where you think, yes, mm -hmm. I've really done it, I've got 100%. But in fact, it, it truly is that the last five percent of the work takes 80% of the time. So you have to also balance out how much time, how much resources am I putting into this for how much benefit on the other side? Um, and a, a really trite reply to that would be, maybe once you've hit 70, you should start thinking about your content again. I, I actually think that's, that's great. That's great guidance. 70 on, on you know, the, the Lighthouse score is actually a really really solid score to have. Oh, right. I was being over ambitious already once you've hit 50. But it, it's the thing <laughs> yeah. is saying, don't just focus on that. Make sure you're still making the great content that people actually want to see because you can have the fastest site in the world. If your content doesn't address the problems and the needs of your audience, they're not going to come anyway. Google's not going to show the content because it doesn't correspond to the user intent. So having the fast website is great, but having the fa fast website will only really serve you if you have the great content to, to back it up. Uh, absolutely, right? You, 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 this, is what, this is what we talked about of, of kind of that trade-off of prioritizing what's gonna be the most impactful. You, you obviously don't wanna stop your content production or your page production engine and getting you know, relevant information back on your site to influence those search results in the first place. Um, and, and you need to have that, that priority back in place. And, you know, I think if, if you're, if you are in that scenario, just like you're describing of, of spending, you know, five days to get the last, you know, 5% out of the lighthouse score, um, you're, you're going to be, you know, wasting a lot of time and, and prioritizing that probably in the wrong places um, as a whole. And it's probably good, it, probably good guidance to say that, that if you're in the 60, 70, you know, range that, yeah, you, you should really just be focusing on improving the back, the, the, the core experience of the site and the content on the site to focus on the right search, search results that you want to optimize for. Yeah, I mean, what I'm really enjoying about the Core Web Vitals is the fact that you can say to a client, this is the big, the big chunk of content that Google perceives as being important. This is actually what people find satisfying when they see that big image or the, the form that they needed to fill in. When it actually appears, they go, I'm satisfied, that's good, that's the content. And so we're really focusing on the user and not the pure speed. And I think we need to reiterate that the Core Web Vitals are about perceived experience. performance and user yep. experience. It's yep. part of the speed scenario, but it really is user experience and perceived speed as opposed to pure speed. Absolutely. Um, great, I'm gonna jump on to the next question here. Um, it, it's a due to specific question, but I'm going to try and relate it back uh, kind of more broadly to the industry here. Um, the way that Duda flashes custom fonts uh, in the platform, is this an issue for performance or core web vitals uh, as a whole? Um, a lot of Duda sites are kind of do this flash of um, loading of a font, and this can impact kind of visual stability as a whole. And um, you know, Rebecca is asking, like, what do you what do you recommend to improve this? And this actually is is a bigger problem across the entire industry today, where you know any type of custom font you're using on your website needs to load usually after you know the page loads. So what what you see happen is, is you know a font loads and then the custom font loads and it updates, and actually that causes a lot of um, CLS issues today on websites because the the content is shifting around right right in front of you. Um, you know, um, I you know, th this actually there, there's not an easy answer to to a lot of this to it within the web today. Um, with the way one of I think one of the things that I think is really difficult about the CLS score is that it it is counterintuitive to the way the web works. Um, mm. So CLS is, is saying great, don't shift content around, but when you load an image on a page, 
that image causes CLS because the image doesn't immediately load and has to load after the fact. And so this is just the way the web works and you need to change your development style to impact um, CLS uh, as a whole. Um, and, and so web fonts are, are very similar to that where any type of font you're loading can cause that. So, you know, there's a few recommendations. One is, um, one is that you can apply a custom dimension to the paragraph or the container that has the actual text in it so that once it loads, it doesn't shift at all. It just, it fills in more with that custom font, essentially. Um, that's, that's one thing you can do uh, across the board. Jason, I don't know if you're familiar with this um, kind of problem. Yeah, um, what I always do with my clients is say, how important is that custom font truly yep. to your business? And the answer is often not very. Um, <laughs> but we think, oh, it's got to be perfect. And this comes back to the bells and whistles idea. I think you need to sit back and analyze and say, what is fundamentally important? And what is just me being fussy and wanting absolute perfection? And I don't like the word compromise, but I do like the word balance. You need to balance user experience, yep. business goals, what Google likes, Bring it all together and make a web page that actually satisfies all three as well as you possibly can. You don't want to fully satisfy Google because if you're going to do that, you're probably not going to be satisfying fully your business goals. If you're only satisfying your business goals, you're probably losing out with Google and your user comes somewhere in the middle. I think if, if, if I've just done it, you've got Google, you've got business goals or yourself. In the middle, you've got the user. The user is probably the best judge of where that balance lies. And I find it difficult to believe that the specific font you wanted in a page is going to significantly change that user's opinion of you. I, yeah, I, I agree. So I'm, I'm being grumpy old man and saying don't use. <laughs> and well, I, there's some truth to what you're saying with, with just the fact that there's no way around a font loading slowly. It's it's just it's just it's just a fact of the web and um, having that flash or the shift. You know, Google has a way of what they call is this is the technical way to do what's called a you know a font swap, which is a little nicer and it's not quite of a jump um, right. that that kind of like loads it in there, but it's still a change in in font. And the only way to avoid that is to use system fonts by default. You know, go back to your Helvetica's, your Arial's, your Times New Roman, what's ever included on you know, the, the, the local computers across the board, those are the things that won't have those problems um, kind of going forward. Um, mm. you know, Duda, we, we, you know, I'm gonna talk about Duda here again, because this is where my experience comes in. Uh, we, we actually do try and solve some of this. We, as part of that process I talked about a little while ago, where we, we scan the site and generate the above the fold styles we actually try and embed the custom fonts in that kind of style set. And so that means that the fonts load as part of the original page load and they don't need to download as a second response. Now, this is not practical for every use case. If you're using many different custom fonts, it's not gonna work because you're gonna have a huge amount of custom fonts that just can't be loaded that way. Um, and so you know, we try and solve for some of this, but but it's not it's not possible. And you know the recommendation is always to to limit and prioritize exactly what you're saying of of if if this is important, let's go with one. Let's make it that really custom font, and let's let's do it. But if it's not, let's let's go a different direction, and let, let's find a comp, let's find a balance, like you say, uh, and and make it work. Yeah. Well, I, I find every time I say a compromise to clients, they freak out uh, because compromises sound like something negative, whereas a balance sounds incredibly positive. So it is. It really is the same word, same idea. Find the balance. You can't win on every single front. You need to find where the right level is for each one. And once again, I mean, I'll say it again because I think it's quite a nice concept. The user is probably always right. Absolutely. I think I think that's right. Cool. I'm going to jump on to our, our next question here uh, from from Margaret. Do you think? Google is using the user experience aspect to force more advertising uh, across the board. I'm curious what you think here, Jason. More advertising in terms of on, on their SERP? Yeah, I think I think if I understand the question, they're, they're trying to, to, to get people to, to essentially use Google more and be able to display more advertising. So is, 
is this you know part of a strategy from Google to to continue to improve kind of the core search results so they can sell more ads uh, across the web? Yeah. Well, I think Google's aim is always to sell more ads, but in fact, part of their business model is now moving towards kind of moving towards the idea of being Amazon and being able to actually sell products. So it's not ads so much. So I wouldn't suggest. My opinion is that Google are not going to rely on ads forever because it's not um, a balanced business model. I talked to Gennaro Cofano from WordLift who does, he, he reads um, financial statements from companies to try and understand what their business model is and where they're likely to go next. And he was saying that Google's business model, Facebook's model is even worse. It's completely lopsided towards advertising and it's probably not sustainable. They're gonna to have to find different solutions. So I personally don't think they're obsessing about it, that they're actually looking for other openings and that what they're doing is actually simply trying to drive once again, user experience so that their users remain faithful to them because what they wanna do is retain their user base so that when they do develop their business model in different ways, they've got still got this vast 90% market share. Um, so, from that perspective, I and I think kind of if 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 I were to play devil's advocate, I would say their aim is the same as yours, satisfying their users, keeping their users, maintaining their clients, keeping them long term. Yeah, absolutely. I I I think I think you're right. I, I don't have much much to add. I think that's that's spot on in my opinion. Um, Right. Oh, I was talking to Nathan Chalmers from Bing, who's the whole page algorithm guy. And basically what you have is the different algorithms. It's same at Google. They, they, they build what the, what the algorithms think is going to be the perfect result. But then they have a whole page algorithm that comes on top and says, actually, that's not going to be a good user experience. So it will juggle things around a little bit and make it a bit better. And one thing he said to me is they skim off an awful lot of ads because it simply doesn't serve user intent, even though the advertiser is willing to pay a fortune. They won't give the ad, they won't show the ad because it doesn't serve the user and it will make them look foolish. They won't be serving the user and the user will then leave and go to the competition. I mean, obviously in Bing's case, it's a bit of a closer call than it is for Google, but however big your market share is, you don't want to lose those users. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, in interesting. Yeah, we've gone off core web vitals there a little bit, but I mean, I, I think kind of business models, I mean, once again, coming back to that, I mean, when I talked to Gennaro for the first time about, he's explained Microsoft, Facebook, Amazon, and Google to me. And the business <laughs> models are phenomenally different. And you can see where they came from, where they are, and where they're going. And one thing that they all have in common, I mean, Microsoft is probably, the, have got the widest uh, variety of sources of income. Uh, Google is doing okay. Amazon is doing very well because of AWS, which has developed yeah. phenomenally. Facebook is sitting on, it, it really is a one trick pony. Um, and I'm terribly intrigued how that's gonna all develop out. I agree, yeah, I mean, it's, it's all the news feed today, right? You know, that's, that's, where, that's where Facebook makes all its money, the, the news feed and, and Instagram ads. That's, that's, the, that's like 95% of their, their total revenue is coming from those two sources. It's nuts. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, it, it, as a business, I mean, I'm a, a, a consultant. I wouldn't have 95% of my 95 of my business coming from one client or one single yeah. idea. Yeah. I think I think Google is about, as I recall from the last earnings, it was about 70% um, mm. of their revenue today is coming from from ads um, uh, across that. I think that's with ad display ads and you know SERP ads that they're selling uh, across the board. Which which you know obviously and then. YouTube is also a big growing aspect as well for them too. So, yeah, no, doing I, their diversification. Yeah, yeah, I think I think they are diversifying, and YouTube is a big chunk. Uh, Google Cloud, all the glue, trying to compete with AWS, they haven't really ma matched it, but they were hoping to. But who knows? They may manage it because the platform I actually use Google Cloud, and I think it's brilliant. I much prefer it to AWS. It's basically AWS for people who don't know how to code, which is great <laughs> if you ask me. Um, but yeah, I think Google are, are, are expanding, of widening their, their, their portfolio of how to make money. And I don't think advertising is such a focus that they're going to um, blow their entire user base to sell a few more ads today. I, I think that's right. I think, I think they're just looking to kind of incrementally improve here with, with kind of the, the core web vitals. And, and that's, that's what we see. And, and it's taken them, you know, 
seven years to really roll this out, right? They've had they've had some form of you know speed testing out there in the market for quite a while now, and and you this is the first time we have real metrics to measure from, um, and it's taken them quite a long time to to get there. So, yeah, brilliant, now wonderful. Yeah, uh, cool. The, the next question um, is from Thomas is asking often Lighthouse reports a long CLS, but when I check, it's invisible to the human eye. Isn't Google overdoing it here uh, from, a, from a reporting perspective? It's yeah, I mean, I, I have that kind of trouble as well. Sometimes you say, I can't see anything move, um, totally. but it isn't because you don't see it move that it didn't move on a 3G connection for somebody in India. Um, and it isn't also because you didn't see it move that the machine hasn't perceived it to have moved. So there you've got a couple of questions, one of which is, remember that Google's measuring on a slow connection on a low powered machine, yep. number yep. one. And number two, even if Google's wrong, it's still right because it's making the decision. <laughs> so, you know, yeah, Google might be wrong, might not be wrong. If you really want to please Google, you don't have much choice. You have to knuckle under. I, I, I think that's right. You know, one, one of the things we see, you know, Google measures this. They measure CLS in, in the browser when they load. And they're actually looking at what elements are shifting on the page. And it, it's mm. very possible that it's something in the background that is not actually presently visible. They try and make it visible, but it's actually not. So sometimes there, there are these CLSs that happen on the page that you just you really can't see. Um, uh, and, and just kind of don't exist. And so it's, it's, it's an interesting question of how Google is optimizing for it. It's, it's incredibly difficult from a technology perspective to track correctly. And I think they're, you know, I think they're right a lot of the time, but there are those, those kind of edge cases where um, they kind of have a false positive and yeah. it's almost, you know, and the, the reporting tools on exactly what, the, what that thing that's causing CLS can be hard to see a lot of times as well. Um, you know, they have some stuff in their developer tools, but it's still not perfect to know what exactly made this change and what caused it to shift. And as this is loading, what what came in that wasn't there before? It's really hard to actually figure out the exact details. Yeah. No, 100 percent. I think you made a third point that I completely missed, which is brilliant. Um, and I would like to re reiterate, I didn't say you have to knuckle under to Google. I said if you want Google to appreciate your content, it's their rules. They're, they're making the rules up for their own game. You're playing their game. You need to abide by their rules. And as you said, even if it's a false positive, you still have to try to figure out why the machine's making that mistake. Correct it on your end because the machine isn't going to correct for you. Uh, it's, it's very true. It's very true. Yeah. Um, great. Um, the next question I, I'll, I'll do, dig in on here is from Robert. Um, is will core web vitals supersede backlinks from a, a priority perspective? Oh, no. Uh, oh, I mean, backlinks are always going to remain important. I think kind of I, I'm, I'm one of these people who never really liked them very much in the first place. Um, they've always been important. I don't like going out and asking people for links. I think it's kind of a bit of a bizarre kind of approach. Um, but from a, a, a the future of the web perspective, links are simply relationships between pages. And the entire future of the web is built on Google's understanding of relationships between things, pages, people, organizations, products, places. Um, so links in terms of the actual physical links between pages is slowly reducing in importance relative to the rest of it. But the idea of relationships is increasingly important and fundamentally important. And I would argue that Core Web Vitals is relatively small fry compared to relationships i agree yeah i, I completely agree and and you know this this is one of those things that you know if you if you follow rand rand fishkin he talks about this in terms of you know he kind of thinks that google is going to rely less on the link and more on kind of an attribution model of here's a sentence that's broadly talking about this service i'm going to give some type of credit back to that service and less so on kind of the technical link as an implementation and more about the topic as a source of authority. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, just one small thing, I completely agree with what you're saying. You know, I think core web vitals is, is a much lower priority on, on that stack from right. a, and a relevance perspective. Well, yeah. I mean, what you're saying is incredibly important. It's like what, what we've been calling the linkless link, which is a mention or a topic or and Google understanding that your uh, com company, your website, 
deals with a specific topic and could potentially bring a solution to its user when they're looking into that topic is phenomenally important. And yeah. I had a very interesting experience. I mean, it's a bit geeky, but uh, a friend of mine challenged me to create a profile page called Jason Brand Nerd <laughs> instead of Jason Barnard. And I did it as a joke. And within a week, now if you search Jason Brand Nerd, it shows me, shows my website, shows all my photos. And it, on pages where I didn't even mention the term Jason Brand Nerd. So it has a, already understood within a week that Jason Brand Nerd is a synonym for Jason Barnard. That's, and the power of mention there becomes, for me, incredibly clear that the power of mention, the power of topic, the power of relationships between right. Jason Brand Nerd and Jason Barnard is incredibly powerful and will, be, will become even more so. Yeah, that's, that's a really interesting kind of test you put out there. Uh, I, I, I want to dig in on that more. It, 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 it sounds, sounds it, cool. Yeah. It, well, it was a joke that kind of went out of out of hand, but it's been incredibly informative about how well Google, once it's understood an entity, which is me. I mean, I'm the brand SERP guy, and I've re, I've worked seven years to get Google to understand who I am, what I do, and what who my audience is, and that just demonstrates that those seven years of work have paid off or are about to pay off. Yeah. So go web vitals. I hate to say this, but if you visit my site, I've got a really bad score <laughs> because I I actually don't think in terms of my specific niche they're important at all. It's it's very true. You you could say that you know most of your visitors are on desktop, and you could you can make that priority and just say, hey, it's it's mm -hmm. less important for me, and I know that I would rather have my my content, and I'm also focusing not on. I'm not focusing on my website. I'm focusing on the actual brand SERPs, which makes total sense for you, and you're prioritizing that for your business. Yeah. yeah. Also, sorry, I'm I'm being a bit facetious by saying, well, I don't care. But actually, it's just I'm much more interested in, in doing experiments like the one with Jason Brand Nerd than I am on working on my core web vitals. And that would be a good example. I'm exactly not the kind of person who would spend five days trying to get from 70% to 95%. Yeah. Right. Great, Jason. We're we're running out of time here. Um, I, I want to wrap up. There's one quick thing I want to call out. There's a bunch of questions which we didn't get to that are about what can I do to improve my due to site? What can, can I do to improve my score? In the follow-up email, I'll make sure that we include um, some kind of support and help documentation that Duda has related to this. Um, so you guys can go, th go through. We have a bunch of kind of best practices that you guys can follow of like, do this, don't do that, don't do this, don't do that type of recommendations. Um, and so I'll, I'll send that out uh, as, as part of uh, our follow-up email, just so those folks who are due to customers uh, can, can get access and kind of read through that. Um, Jason, is, is there anything else you want to you wanna mention before we, we sign off here? I'm really appreciative of you coming in and joining us. And I think this was a, a really fun discussion from my perspective. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to thank you for having me. I enjoyed it a great deal. Talking about Core Web Vitals was a great deal of fun. You're a delightful and terribly knowledgeable chap. And uh, um, thank you for having me. And I, I enjoyed it a great deal. Great. Thank you so much, everybody. And everyone have a, a good afternoon or a good evening, uh, wherever you're based. Yeah, thank you, everybody. Bye, guys.